Catherine. Yes. Nice to meet you. Yeah. And you Just a few months ago, most Canadians had no idea who she was. But now, Maria Monsef is set to play a pivotal role in their lives. We need to make sure that people feel like their vote counts. But how did a young girl from such a closed society like Afghanistan make it to the hallowed halls of Parliament Hill? From a young age, we were brought up to believe that we're going to do something with our lives. And how did this refugee from one of the least open countries in the world now rise to the role of a cabinet minister tasked with reshaping our country's electoral system? To give back to the people who gave us so much. In many ways, it's the story of Canada. And this, the personal story of Maria Monsef. This place taught me to nurture those different aspects of me. You go out on one evening and the next day you wake up a quadriplegic. I like politics as well and it came in my life uh, almost unexpectedly. Can I see what you got in your back? Hi, nice to meet you too. Hi everybody. Thank you so much. I love that and thank you. She's Canada's Minister of Democratic Institutions, but many also see Maria Monsef as Canada's Minister of Inclusivity, and with good reason. She's been charged with making government more open for all, reforming both how MPs are elected and how federal senators are appointed. At age 30, she became the youngest and first female Muslim federal minister in the Trudeau cabinet. I was in the arts program, so... And for Monsef, the road to Ottawa all started right here, inside this humble red brick building in Peterborough, Ontario. So this is Peterborough Collegiate Vocational School. We're inside and uh, the minister is here. Good Hello. to see you, minister. Welcome. Pleasure. Thank you for the invitation to your old high school. So what's this like for you? You were just a young teenager, of course, and entered here at 14. And a bit of a troublemaker, <laughs> but this place, and you see some of the works of art on the walls, that's Derek Bell. Uh, we went to PCBS together. It's Sarah Kastner who painted that. Mm -hmm. This place taught me that all those weird things about me, all those quirky things about me, all the ways that you know, I was trying to fit in at that age, as many teenagers do, well, this place taught me to nurture those different aspects yeah. of me. So you, when you came here, I mean, you were only in Canada as a new immigrant, mm -hmm. what, three years before you started About school two here? two years. So you felt like an outsider. That's I why you say, you know, I felt a little weird or out of place. I was you, an awkward teenager to begin with, so and, did, yeah. and you didn't speak English that well? Right? By the time I came to high school, so I had two years of English learning, yeah. ESL learning under my belt, and I had gone, you know, suddenly from not speaking English and not being able to communicate, right. uh, suddenly I can communicate, and so you can imagine uh, all the ways that I was perhaps over chatting uh, at times you when got I should trouble. Never... You told me I this did. for talking I too did. much. So I did. I. I don't feel so bad. I did. <laughs> This is my old math math class. I was here for five years, and Mr. Roberts uh, would do handstands in exchange for rockets. And really? Yeah, just a different kind of school. Did you do well in math? Were you a strong math student? I did well. This is Canada's second oldest high school, correct? It is. Smell that. My main assignment as a grade nine arts program uh, student my first assignment was to stand right there and, uh, and uh, audition for the cabaret. And so I'm, I did a monologue, a really serious monologue. And this is <laughs> one of those embarrassing moments that will forever be in my, in my brain. So I stood on the stage and you know, I'm getting into that scene mode to give a really serious monologue. And then Hank from the back of the auditorium yells, your fly's open. So I turn around up my fly and that was my introduction to theater and being on the on the stage you're vulnerable when you're up there much like you are as a politician mr. speaker the people of this country deserve to be consulted on a matter as important <laughs> Coming back, did you ever think you'd be back 
at your old high school, coming back as a federal cabinet minister? Never. No, it's, look, I am just... Were you even on student council? No, I told you, I was not. <laughs> my, my, I have team members who are working with me now. Lauren Hunter's name is on one of these walls who had their act together long before I did. I spent a lot of time here discovering myself. I was different looking, I didn't speak the language, I didn't understand the culture, I didn't dress like the other kids. Sister Jones, so you remember a very young Mary Monsef coming here with her mother and two sisters. Tell us a little bit about that day that you met her or how you knew her. Okay. I was working with uh, Sister Ruth on the board of Casa Maria, and uh, Miriam came when I was in kind of in my first fervor. I had just come from another job to Peterborough, and the first thing that I noticed was what beautiful little girls they were. 1996, you arrived here with your family, and this is Casa Maria run by the Sisters of St. Joseph's, right? Correct. It's great to see you. Are we on camera? Are we on camera? No. Oh my goodness. I think it's fitting that it's being redone. Oh my goodness. New carpet. You know what I remember? Your mom cooking. And all the couches lined up. Remember? I do. I remember being a brat here and you putting up with us. Yes, you were a brat. Yeah, we were. My goodness. Mm. This is where we slept more. All of us in all one room. We all slept there. Do you know it'll be 20 years in May? That you were here. 20 years, and I'm still walking. We're both still walking. Can you believe? 20 years. Went by in a flash. Uh -huh. So, the place okay. is getting a remodeling. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be nice. This is the place where, you know, people like Sister Ruth made us feel like, yes, we gave up a lot of people we loved, and a lot of familiarity and traditions, but there was going to be a community here looking after us. How old were you when you first arrived here? 11. 11 years old. Sister Ruth, you were here? Yes. At the time? Yes. Do you remember that first day or first week that Miriam and her family arrived? I just remember three beautiful girls and a very wonderful mother. Now, this wouldn't be fun without my family pulling something and uh, making me feel a little more awkward than I usually do. So, uh, mom, <laughs> who showed up. <laughs> and part of the questions that she had was, um, I risked everything to bring my daughters here, and um, I'm not sure I did the right thing. She wanted freedom for them, but Canadian freedom was mm -hmm. something very different. I remember her asking me one time, should they wear the um, traditional um, outfit? And I said, if you were in Toronto, there'd be no problem. In Peterborough, you might, your children might be centered out and teased. This is the Muslim hijab. This is the Muslim hijab, or whatever yeah. you call it. And, uh, you know, she questioned that, and she didn't um, put her girls in that outfit. Miriam and her sisters could not speak any English, so it was really difficult for them. Mm -hmm. But um, they were friendly and lovable and just really good kids. Did you know the story of you know what they went through and what they endured and no? no didn't what know. did you know? We knew nothing about you on your arrival, just that their uncle um, was here in Peterborough and asked for uh, shelter mm -hmm. for Soraya and her three girls. And because this basement apartment was empty, they were welcome. But here's a home run by the Catholic Sisters. You're a young Muslim girl, a young Muslim family. Um, was that odd? Was that difficult? Was that a stressor or a strain? Or it, you never would have known there was a, any difference in religion? Not even once. You know, I was brought up to believe that, uh, you know, caring for humanity and uh, making sure that you're on the right path 
uh, not being a jerk, basically. These are the tenets that you need to live by. And the more conversations people have across faith groups, the more quickly they realize how much they have in common. And we felt right at home here in this place where we didn't speak a common <laughs> language. So the lessons here from the sisters that you learned were what? That it's going to be okay, that we are not alone, that this can be a home. This place, the New Canadian Centre in Peterborough, was established in a direct response to uh, the efforts that this community was uh, involved with around welcoming Vietnamese refugees over 30 mm -hmm. years ago. This is where my mom uh, got a lot of the support that she needed, whether it was around you know housing or SIN cards or finding a community, learning English. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very special, very special you place. You must be so proud, though, that there's such a intent and goodwill within Peterborough to help other families, like your own, um, all the Syrian refugees that have arrived here. How many do we know? Have there, so I was at a government assisted refugees uh, symposium last night and we are expecting I believe 36 government assisted refugee families mm -hmm. here. So we can use this at home or at the or this. <laughs> One particular story that's shaped my life significantly uh, is the story of um, a young Afghani woman in the late 70s in Afghanistan. She's got a full scholarship to study medicine anywhere in the world and her bags are packed and she said her goodbyes and she's ready to take off uh, and become the first woman to be a doctor in the family and then they receive news that one of their own uh, has been impacted by the war in Afghanistan. The war is on their doorsteps. Those dreams uh, that she had to become a doctor are gone. Um, not too long after, she gets married to Prince Charming, and every day they're together, they fall more and more in love. They end up having three daughters, and they want 12 kids because, you know, they can afford it, and the kids are healthy, and hopefully they'll grow up to give back to society. And then three, four years later, he is caught in a crossfire uh, across the border, and he's killed. And she's 23, left with three baby girls to look after, and no way to support herself and she tries teaching but then the Taliban come and she can't teach anymore and as a widow she has no status in that country and miraculously she's able to find her way uh, halfway around the world to Canada. She ends up here in Peterborough, Ontario where an unlikely place for immigrants, for refugees, you would think a rural Ontario uh, town uh, maybe but this is the place where a whole community comes around them and makes them feel like they belong, makes them feel like they can start a new life here. And this place has a great deal of meaning for me because this is the place where that woman came and this is the place where... That was your mother? My mother gave up everything she knew and she, she took a big risk and it's paid off. There were a lot of costs associated with it and still are, but... Thankfully, we are here and have an opportunity to give back and to be to give back to the people who gave us so much. Thank you, the people of Peterborough, Kawartha. So, no one moment that said, "Okay, I need to go, go into politics," but uh, a series. Of you just knew you could make a difference for people. So my grandfather, the man who raised my mother to believe that she could be the first woman, a doctor in the family, he came in and filled the void of a father when we were little. And one of his teachings was, you know, you're going to grow up to do great things. And we would ask him, well, why did these horrible things happen to us, Grandpa? And he would say, well, this is to teach you what it feels like to hurt and to lose so that when you grow up, you can ease the suffering of others. And so, you know, from a young age, we were brought up to believe that we're going to do something with our lives. I'm Mariam Monsef. When you first learned that you would be a member of the Trudeau cabinet, you weren't expecting that. Absolutely not. And when you learned you'd be the minister of for democratic institutions, did you have any semblance that that is where you might be headed at all? And how did you react to that? 
I, I reacted to it with stunned silence, actually. Uh, when the Prime Minister uh, asked if uh, I would take on this responsibility, I just, I didn't have words. I was just humbled and worked really hard to be the Member of Parliament for Peterborough Kawartha. I didn't expect to have the privilege to be around that table. Being a cabinet minister is a big deal, I can imagine, but um, for you, how important is this constituency here and working for the people that elected you as well? Uh, like my other cabinet colleagues, my first and most important responsibility is being an effective member of parliament for the people of Peterborough Kawartha, and this is a responsibility I don't take lightly. This is. This is the place that has shaped me to a great extent. It's taught me a lot about effective leadership and inclusion. Uh, and this is the place that fills me up and is a constant reminder of why I entered uh, public life. But also, the, you're part of the Trudeau cabinet, the Trudeau government, which promised to do politics differently. And of course, you won this riding from um, a former conservative that used to hold it, Dean Del Mastro. Um, there was electoral fraud. He stepped down. Um, and I wonder how that affected you, you watched that unfold, and how that affected this constituency, this community as well. Uh, unfortunately, what happened here was not unique to our riding. Uh, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, the democratic institutions in this country, the confidence that Canadians have uh, in their representatives and in these uh, places, uh, it, it was affected negatively. Hi, Miriam. How are you? Hi. I'm well, how are you? I'm good, nice to see you. So I usually ask people who are 18 years or older what their biggest concern is these days. And so as Minister for Democratic Institutions, you've been tasked with this massive reform, and will it be electoral reform that really is your most important work right now, would you say, and what does that entail? This idea of a reinvigoration of our democratic institutions, it involves so much more than just electoral reform and finding a way to bring the way we elect our members of parliament into the 21st century and considering online voting and mandatory voting, for example. It's more than ensuring that the appointment process for um, Senate selection uh, is more open and transparent. So electoral f reform is needed because we've got a situation now that's pretty much first past the post, right, in terms of how the votes that we all cast during elections count. So we're endeavoring, or your government's endeavoring to move it towards proportional representation, meaning if you get 39% of the vote, you get 39 seats, or how, how does that translate? How would that look? The campaign commitments that we made uh, prior to the October 19th election, they were based on conversations that you know, the Prime Minister had, and all of us had. The Prime Minister spoke to Canadians for three years, experts, academics. Uh, he connected with people one-on-one -on -one at their doorsteps. And we heard very clearly from Canadians that one of the things that needs to change is the way that we elect parliamentarians. We need to make sure that people feel like their vote counts. And we need to ensure that that openness and transparency that is at the heart of being able to trust uh, your government. But what does that reform look like? Well, and here's the thing. Something I appreciate about this government, part of doing politics differently, we have not come to this table with all the answers. And our commitment during the campaign, and now my task, mm -hmm. is to have a genuine conversation with an open mind, with the people of this country. So you don't want to say what it looks like because the consultations aren't complete, is that it? That is correct. And I want to ask you, there are those, again, who would say, well, this is the Liberals attempting to bolster their own chances in future elections. How do you respond to that? Because they say the Liberals are second on the NDP ballots, right? People who cast a vote for the NDP will vote Liberal traditionally second, and Conservative uh, voters also choose Liberals typically as a second choice, and they say that will favor Liberal governments. I think those are the pundits uh, mm -hmm. that enjoy a great deal uh, speculating uh, about one outcome over the other. Uh, you know, we are 
in government, you know, nearly 50% of the time we as liberals have been in government, the existing system, and we showed in this last election that with hope and hard work and the right leadership, uh, that liberals can get elected. This is not about making things better for ourselves. And I've asked the prime minister this. I've poked and I've prodded. And this That's isn't not a, the intent. This is not about us. This is about enhancing our democratic institutions so that the next generation and the generations to come will benefit from the reforms that we put forward. Senate reform? Something I'm really proud of. and <laughs> You've already moved in that direction, though. Day 29 on the job, mm -hmm. uh, I was at the press gallery with uh, my colleague Dominic LeBlanc. And this, in our view, was the best way to show Canadians real change. And um, this is the change that Canadians asked for. We're simply delivering on a promise that we made to Canadians. I'm we were announcing this new open and transparent process for appointing senators and just recently uh, the Prime Minister uh, announced his intention to appoint seven exceptional Canadians uh, to the upper chamber and we're already seeing the conversation about Senate and senators is changing. I'd like to begin by thanking the people of Peterborough Kawartha for the trust and support that they've shown me. I, I want to just take you back to that very first day when you got elected and you had that very first speech in the House of Commons. Your mom was in the gallery. Sister Joan mm -hmm. from the Sisters of St. Joseph's, mm -hmm. you also invited. Um, do you remember how you felt in that moment? I had been working towards that moment, you know, in the heat of the summer when I was knocking on doors and getting sunburns and awful tans. That was the moment that I kept thinking about in that place. I will stand and my mother will be there and my community will be there and it'll be the beginning of um, a journey that will hopefully mean good things for the people who, who made good things happen for what me. Was that, what was going through your mind at that moment? I, I did this? Or I, I was nervous and um, incredibly humbled and what, you know, the first time a woman of my lineage ends up in that place, and it's a place where a lot of good things have happened, not just for Canadians, but for people all over the world. And now I'm a part of that. Do you tell new refugees your story, where you came from, that your mother was lucky enough to get to this country, but you know, left overseas? You're now a federal cabinet minister. Do you tell people that you started off in, you know, in many cases in a similar circumstance that they're in? If people ask, I do, uh, but I also respect that uh, refugees, when they come to a new place, uh, their priorities uh, are about uh, settling in, finding employment. You know, there are families who are waiting to bring in Syrian refugees too, who are frustrated. They want to help, and there's backlog and delays, and that must be difficult for you with your background, trying to help, knowing you can help, but there are things in the way. I was uh, at a gathering of over 300 community volunteers who were coming together to coordinate their efforts on how we could welcome government-assisted refugees more effectively in this, in this riding. And, you know, there's a lot of momentum and there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of philanthropy and there's a lot of um, synergy happening all over this community, just like we see across the country. But like all journeys that are uh, new and bold and um, based on a grand vision, this will not always be an easy road. And I don't feel helpless when I hear these stories. Actually, I feel empowered because I see these citizens taking into their own hands matters that they can effectively do something about. And I see a response of government, you know, Minister McCallum, I respect this man because he actually is listening to Canadians and settlement agencies and these uh, sponsor sponsorship groups. And um, with that mix of collaboration and openness uh, to new ideas, I don't feel helpless at all. I feel hopeful. How do you bring hope to people who are here and maybe see even some of the hatred? Um, you know, people who, and we see it here, um, you know, what happened even with the Peterborough Mosque? a case of arson and people telling immigrants to go home. Some of that was directed at you personally as well. That must hit right to the heart for you. I have lived here for 20 years and I've been campaigning, you know, for close to two years in this political landscape. 
I can tell you that 99% of the experiences I've had, 99% of the conversations I've had, they've been conversations of other people giving me hope, other people giving me strength. They have been productive and empowering conversations. And if I had to take all the negativity and some of the ones that you just referred to and put them into a box, mm -hmm. that's the 1% box. And that Peter Burrow mosque fire, though, when mm -hmm. you learned that was arson, and perhaps you suspected it earlier on, that's your community? That's a mosque in your community? You're a Muslim representative? Did you take that personally? Did you take that as a message? The, the salient part of that story around the arson at the mosque is how the community responded. I didn't even have much of a chance to go to that dark place of how can this kind of hate exist? Because in less than 30 hours, you know, how much money did this community raise? Uh, in, in less than 30 hours, we had people from all over the country showing support for the people of this riding. We had the synagogue and indigenous peoples and various churches. So much so the prime minister showed and, up to, and to lend his support. the prime minister yeah. recognized that that is what it means to be a Canadian. That is who we are as Canadians. But and have you had them? moments where of you're course, frightened? Of course. Of course, but then, you know, I think of the Malalais of the world. I think about the little girl who took a bullet to the head and continued her work. If, if she can do that, I can do this. And there are many places in the world where women especially cannot feel safe as, as politicians and leaders, and I can. I have to ask you just quickly, you're a very public figure, obviously your work is public. What about your private life? What private life? <laughs> do you aspire? But you know, do you aspire? We talked about your family. Do you aspire to have a family one day, have kids of your own, or is that on the list? I think that probably the greatest honor out there is being a mother. Right now, I'm married to Peterborough Kawartha, and right now, I have way more kids and allies and friends uh, than than one person uh, could expect to have. But maybe one day, someday, maybe. Yeah. And what will you tell your son or daughter about? Canada and what it's afforded you? Oh, just don't take any of the privileges lightly and work hard and be part of your community. And like I said before, in this country, anything, anything is possible. There we are. I can help if you'd like. Perfect. There we go. Whoops. Wait, it's filming. Oh, it's filming. There's it's already filming. a person filming this. <laughs> Also, you're good at that. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Say hi. I will. Is that Thank a good photo? I don't think there are any good photos. <laughs> this one has a good no, high school photo. Not. To the teachers who showed they cared. And to my family, thanks for putting up with me. Yeah. You were trouble. Yeah. Oh, thanks, PC, for letting me be me. I'll do good. So if we were to return here at the end of the four-year mandate of the Liberal government and I were to say, what what would you have hoped to have achieved in the past four years? What would you, how would you answer that? What would you say? Beyond delivering on the promises I made to the people who elected me, uh, I really hope that at the end of this four year mandate, especially around the democratic renewal initiatives that we've committed to, I really hope that we inspire the next generation of leaders, that there are more young people, voices that aren't usually included. They're active and they're inspired and they're motivated. I think that's probably the best outcome we can hope for. In your case, so Minister, far so good. Minister, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us here to Peterborough and um, should we have another look at that yearbook photo? Uh, maybe we can <laughs> do that in four years too. <laughs>